All right, you guys, it's Ross the Fig Boss. So in today's video, we are on uh, the west side of the property looking at one of my in-ground fig tree plantings here. We have another one that's probably double or maybe even triple the size um, over that way on the west side as well. Um, this is definitely though the shadiest spot of my yard. Um, so I didn't realize that I would have such trouble growing figs in this shady spot um, because it wasn't until years later after I planted these, these trees here that uh, you, I realized that I need a really a certain amount of light to really set those fruits. And um, if I didn't get enough light, the fruits just don't form. And as a result, these trees over here, they just don't produce the amount of fruits that they should. Even when I thin them out, so even thinning out the branches, staking the branches, giving them the maximum amount of light that they can reach, um, that I can personally let them uh, have by intervening on the branches, it's still really not enough. And um, I do have a variety over here called Moro de Caneva that, that actually sets pretty well over here. You could say that Gayette has set pretty decently. Also, Tolosa has set decently. And then this fig here that we're gonna look at today, I would say is, is okay for this location, but it definitely needs a bit more light. And it's called Vertolino. And uh, this is a fig that I've really been looking forward to for years. I had not um, really anticipated it to be this good. I, had, I have a, a fig right here in front of me that I've harvested a few days ago uh, it's been sitting in the fridge. I, I cut out a half of it and set a half of it aside so that, you know, I could always come back and do a video on it because the, the half that I did eat, I was so impressed that I was like, I got to get this, this fig on camera for you guys. Also, I've had more figs since then and continued to really be impressed by this particular tree. So that's what we're going to talk about is actually this, this variety here called Vernalino. And uh, it's an Italian variety that I don't really know where it comes from exactly because um, I know this is a, a fig that Mario, my friend Mario in Connecticut um, has grown or is growing. And he is the one who's kind of spread this one around the fig community. Um, but also I believe if I'm not mistaken, he got this fruit from Paolo Bologna. So I'm not entirely sure though beyond that, you know, where it comes from or really anything about it. So this is, might even just be just some local Italian variety that he's just preserving, you know? Um, and there's a longer name. It's not just, um, I think, strictly Vertolino. I think there's a name in addition to that that uh, describes the location, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'll have to look up the exact spelling and all that and you can find photos of this fig online in different, uh, different places, but it's Really, there's not a ton of information. So me doing a video here, I think is really gonna help people out. And this is really gonna be something new that people are not necessarily aware of. And um, I think personally, this is easily one of the best figs I grow. Um, and it's, you know, it's really um, been amazing to see because there's been about six or seven varieties this year that really have impressed me. Um, like Black Celeste is really one that's, I think, just inserted itself very quickly into its, my top three. It may even be my second best fig, I think, right, be, right behind Verdino del Nord. Um, this one here is a very similar situation where I knew that going into this, I had a lot of, it had a lot of potential. I knew that it was going to do well here because it's, it's got that elongated shape here, guys. You know, you saw it, it has that long stem. It has a long neck. It has a slender body. So it's not even typically a really large fruit, but everything about it is just very slender and thin. And then when it hangs, it hangs in a way that's just so perfect so that it deals with the moisture here so well. And because it does that, as you guys know at this point, you should know that the figs that just perform the best and are gonna consistently ripen to perfection more often than the other ones are gonna be the best tasting fruits, just on average. So considering that, those are the best overall figs I have. Are they the best tasting figs I have? 
you know, um, not necessarily. But this one here actually is one of the best tasting figs I have. Like, in addition to it being, you know, this is the beauty that comes with this. It just somehow ends up working out like that. And that's really why I think there needs to be a higher value placed on these heirloom figs, these long lost varieties that are quite rare or, you know, that's why people like Paolo Bologna are doing such great work in Italy, preserving many of these varieties uh, so that they don't disappear. You know, and it's now, you know, at some point I'll be doing something similar with, with select varieties that I think I deem are worthy uh, but also I think it's more my job to just spread the varieties that are worthy around and really make them safe, right? To make them have such a higher reputation that uh, they're not going anywhere, really. And it doesn't matter what Paolo Bologna does because now they're going to be in so many people's yards, as an example. So this is one that, again... It pretty much checks all the boxes. Uh, it does seem quite vigorous. I have been struggling. This tree here has been here for, this is its second season, I believe. So I've had this tree for a while and it's just not growing that well. So it's still getting itself slowly established and when I planted it, it wasn't very well established. Um, I think even what happened was last year, this tree died all the way down to the ground and I thought I was gonna lose it. And it wasn't until around June, middle of June, even maybe July or something like that, where the tree had finally sent out a, a, some growth from lower down below the soil and I was able to recover the variety. Um, I actually think I got this from my friend Matt, my friend Matty in Long Island, if I'm not mistaken. I have to double check my records, but I remember distinctly messaging him and saying, Matt, I think my Vertolino is dead. Can you, you have any more cuttings or you have another plant or something? And, uh, and then I was like, he's like, no, I don't, I don't have anything extra raw. Sorry, I can't help you this year. Uh, and then I was like, you know, I was like, okay, that's fine. Because actually I thought there was a, still a chance that it could come back and it ended up doing that. So it's been taking a while that last year that that happened really set the tree back compared to the rest of these trees because they were all planted at the same time, you know, of different sizes, different maturity levels. But the fact that this one took so long to come back from below the soil did in fact make it so that it is, you know, very small at this point. Um, so that's unfortunate in that one regard. But here's the tree and you can see there's a couple, a couple suckers that have come up couple blower branches but they didn't grow very well oddly enough whereas this one branch here did and then this one branch I I staked it because I wanted to get it a lot of light thinking that if I put that branch on a pretty steep angle these lower branches would get enough light and have the dominance to grow but they just haven't grown and um, you know as I said there's not a lot of light here and also the soil here isn't very good because in the middle of this used to be a berm. So there's a row right here in front of us that you guys see going this way. And there's another row in the middle. And in that middle row is all peat moss. And that peat moss with a lot of these trees, excuse the camera there, I just kicked you guys. With this peat moss, it really doesn't have enough water that's getting to these plants. And therefore, a lot of them in this middle row have struggled to grow for the most part. Um, some of them are getting themselves finally dug in, given enough water. I just keep watering them as much as I can. But that's, you know, the limited uh, in-ground tree I, I can show you. I have some potted trees we'll look at in a second, but let me try the fruit. So there's still a lot I don't know, right? I think it is quite vigorous, I do believe. I think it needs a little bit more light than this. This spot only gets like five hours of light, so it needs at least six, seven hours, uh, you know, definitely more light than it gets here, guys. And it'll set the fruit buds, I think, relatively easily. I think it's actually an early variety. If you look at Mario's records, it is one of the earlier varieties. Um, I don't recall if it produces a Brava, 
I don't know how hardy it is, but if I had to guess, a lot of these old Italian heirlooms are a bit hardier than, than not on average. Um, so there's a lot of question marks, but there's the fig and right away is a really awesome berry flavor. It is um, almost a little musky, tastes a lot like a strawberry, a little bit like a grape. It's very sweet and the pulp is extremely thick, um, sticky, cakey. It's on the level of a cold dom, I think. Um, so I am thoroughly, thoroughly impressed with how the mouthfeel, the texture of it, the flavor of it is out of this world. So it's got a great berry flavor. It's got great texture, good sweetness, cakiness. Um, yeah, I'm just blown away. And I think, you know, it's not the prettiest fig as you saw some of the sugar spots on it, but you know what? That will probably change in the future. Um, here's the, you know, maybe the next one that'll ripen, maybe in time, I'm not sure. But yeah, there's another fruit down there. And then here's, I guess, a decent shot of the leaf pattern, but I'm expecting even better fruits. You know, that tree is so young that how can I possibly, if I'm already blown away at this point, how could it not get better? You know, that's like insane to me is that that particular tree, that particular fruit. I also went ahead and, and rooted as many cuttings as I could because I knew this tree was gonna be something and I wanted to have copies of it, just knowing the potential. And this is one that I rooted this, uh, this winter. It's in a five gallon pot and I, you can see this is a new one that I rooted in a, a one gallon, up potted it in the spring and now it's pretty decent. I think I have another one in here somewhere that is on the smaller side. So what I'm gonna do actually, we have an air layer on the tree. Yeah, here's the other one right here. Here's actually a fruit, look at that. So this is a smaller one that we've up potted later. I may even have a little extra one that's in a one gallon size that's really small. It needs some time to grow. But this one I think I'm gonna plant directly in the ground or if not, I will plant that air layer that we saw over there directly in the ground. So I wanna have two of them in the ground at least. And I'm gonna plant that probably this weekend because um, I know how incredible this fruit is. So that's, that's Vertolino. Um, I can't really get much better than that, I think. Um, I hope it does perform to the way that I think it should. So we haven't really seen it, you know, in a ton of rain, like Verdino del Nord and Ruccillo de Elba and Moro de Caneva and even Campaneri. We've seen them all really perform in the rain. And, and same thing with Black Celeste. We've seen them all do their thing in the rain and be almost unfazed compared to a lot of these other figs, which I can't tell you guys how many fruits I pick this this fall i've been picking you know maybe one fruit is good and every then for every one fruit there's four of them that i throw away and have to toss out and i have a you know i have like a a, a, a what is this <laughs> a uh, a bucket over here of fermenting fruit with water and soap in it to try to uh you know, attract a lot of the uh, fruit flies over here and away from the figs. The fruit flies have been out of control this year. This is by far the worst year. It's not even close. Um, so that's part of it, of why I'm getting, this is, you know, the, as bad of a year as it is, but, uh, you know, these are the, the varieties, guys, that will be able to withstand all that nonsense, at least the ones I mentioned, and I'll still be able to produce a good fruit. So that's where I'm at. It's like if I didn't have some of these fruits that just kept splitting and had open eyes and were easily accessible to the fruit flies, yeah, I would still probably have some fruit flies and they would high in number and yeah, they would still affect the varieties I mentioned, but it would be a lot less of a headache, a lot less of a hassle. And instead of, you know, one, every one good fruit I get and having four bad fruits, I'd probably have like four good fruits for every one bad fruit. You know, that's typical of what I would see. 
So yeah, that's the variety. That's a look at the planning. We'll see you guys soon. Take care.